Hello, everyone, and welcome to, actually, it's the last Career Lab session um, before graduation. So we have a really great presenter. Luke's going to talk about um, what to do with all that money that's right around the corner for you, and uh, also a safety net. So <laughs> I've taken advantage of his advice just in the last few months, <laughs> which is very, very grateful. Uh, so before we talk, though, I want to do a quick catch up on where you should be at. Um, we're in week two, so that's going to be um, the interview stuff. And honestly, we've done all of our synchronous stuff, and I've been eavesdropping on a couple of conversations. So I know that people are meeting with their partners and have been making um, uh, appointments with their mentors to go over for their mock interviews. But that's basically where we're at is meeting up with your collabi partner just to go over the job fit and especially the technical because those are more technical questions just to kind of feel your way through your things, your answers and responses, working on and hopefully being close to done with your hour or two that you spent on the mock um, assignment, the take home assignment, and then meeting with uh, your job fit I'm going to say coach almost, but your job fit mock interview and your technical and have all that done. Hopefully by Saturday, Sunday's fine too. And then I'll see you next on Sunday at your graduation, nine Pacific, noon Eastern. Um, if you need a little bit extra time, that's totally fine. I know there were a few people that got really busy this week, so they've been able to reach out to their uh, volunteer mentors to like reschedule things like that are fine. It's not like strict class due dates. Um, but I hope whether you're done or not, you do join us on Sunday because we'd love to talk to you and find out how everything went. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our star for the evening. Take it away, Luke. Thanks, Shelly. And I'll share the screen here. Hopefully you all can see that. Uh, so today we're going to talk about navigating your finances during a career change. Like Shelly said, is uh, there's a lot coming down the, the pipe here uh, for you guys, hopefully soon. Uh, and it just means a lot of cool opportunities, lots of different situations that maybe you've never thought of before. And that's why I have so much fun uh, doing this present presentation for the Collab Lab uh, every every quarter when they have their uh, cohorts. Um, my name is Lucas Caceres. I'm the founder of Level Up Financial Planning. I also have a tax firm where I'm cranking out taxes right now. Uh, that's called Power Up Tax Planning. I have a podcast that I'm a little less uh, consistent on these days, but I still crank things out when uh, big topics come up that I want to make sure I tackle and share with people. I also have videos, strategy guides, cheat sheets, all, all kinds of resources. So uh, even though we're just going to be hidden uh, as an overview on kind of what to plan for and think about with your finances while you're making this career change. Uh, if there's questions that come up, I most likely have some type of resource for you or can kind of point you in the right direction. So uh, even after today's event, uh, feel free to reach out at any time. I'm in uh, the site group, just ping me and I'll, I'll shoot you some resources that kind of point you in the right direction. I live in Colorado. We love Colorado. We've been here uh, like 11 years, 12 years now at this point, and we have a bunch of kids. Uh, they're all a year and a half older than this picture shows up. Um, I just haven't gotten, I think we have one new picture. I could probably update this to the next time around. Um, and we have one dog as well that's super fun and playful. He's getting older up there too. Uh, he's been out around with us since we moved out to Colorado, basically. But uh, that's just quick notes about me. Today, we're going to be talking more specifically into how to be financially successful. I'm going to give you a couple of example scenarios to just kind of give you an idea of how you can choose one path or choose another. And then at the end of the day, the reason why I love finances is because there's no like perfect one answer. You kind of have to meld your goals, what's important to you, along with your resources and and timelines and, and all these fun things. And so uh, there's more than one way to kind of reach a, a path and and kind of reach your goal there. Um, we'll also talk about this or that, which is basically the frequently asked questions I get all the time. I'm um, just going to kind of fire drill right through those things and allow you to ask some additional questions there. Uh, also, what to be aware of in tech, uh, as we've seen right now, lots of layoffs, 
uh, hiring freezes, things like that. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those other things that are going to be unique to uh, tech from what I've seen in my experience with my clients. And then uh, also have a couple minutes at the end for Q&A. Also, uh, feel free to ask some Q and uh, questions throughout the presentation. I'll uh, be stopping periodically to check in with everyone. But yeah, thanks for being here today. We'll dive straight in after we look at these disclosures. So uh, as a financial planner, I have these regulations I have to follow. This basically says, hey, today is for educational purposes. I uh, don't take anything that I put in here as a specific advice to you because uh, you might have a different situation than the general kind of overview I'm trying to provide. Um, but I think uh, what is a good idea is to just kind of, if there's something that piques your interest, uh, Google it, YouTube it, whatever it is that you like to kind of drill down into things or, or reach out to me and I can kind of be your personal Google and send you those uh, resources. But yeah, if you get interested in something, uh, jot it down and just make sure that you follow up on it and find out more because these things are a lot more complicated than just that the overview we'll be able to spend time on today. So does money impact happiness? This is something I see debated all the time. And, and it actually does to a point, and this is basically a, what that graph would look like. So that point would be right about here. Um, it, it still impacts happiness a little bit, but just not as much as you think. So if you're making 100,000 and then you get an extra $10,000, that's not adding the same type of happiness it would if you were making 10,000 and then you made another 10,000. And so what happens is over time, you actually have all of your needs covered. And then it's just the miscellaneous stuff that maybe is less valuable to you. And um, you still might get some joy out of it. It's just not going to be as lasting or as big of a bump from, hey, b before I could only eat off the dollar menu. And now I can go to Whole Foods and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, up here, uh, you'll see that money is not going to make people happy that are already making 100,000, 200,000 not happy. Um, so that, I think that's an important thing uh, to kind of, a detail because I, I see it all the time where people make a ton of money and they're like, this ain't enough. I feel poor. Like, well, I, I know a lot of people making way less than that, super happy and 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 being able to do all their things. So I, I, there might be some other things going on there. Um, so at the end of the day, it, it does impact happiness, but not as much as you think, especially once you're kind of well into your tech career and, and probably going to be near that six figures or above um, those additional raises and bonuses. Heck yeah, that's good that you're being rewarded for that. Um, definitely take it. But yeah, you might notice that uh, it's, it's probably not the same as that first huge pay pay jump, that first huge paycheck that you get from making that career change. And so what does it mean to be financially successful? So um, being happy definitely helps. But, but again, the finances don't necessarily correlate always exactly to being happy or uh, being successful. Um, financially successful, you don't have to make six figures. I've I got a couple clients that have never crossed the six figure mark, and they're going to retire early. They're, they have plenty plenty of room. They started early. They've been saving a decent amount. They don't spend a ton. They're happy, and uh, yeah, never even gotten close to crossing six figures at this point. And they're more successful than some of my clients making three hundred thousand and are a little bit more spendy. So that how much you make isn't necessarily going to ensure that you're going to be financially successful from a paycheck and cash flow standpoint for those months. It might feel good, but it also matters about what you do with it. Um, and that comes down to having those good habits. So you have to uh, not just be lucky. So just, just get in the paycheck and going to a hundred thousand. Well, if you didn't have good financial habits beforehand and all of a sudden your income increases, most likely those habits are not going to change. You're still going to have bad habits. They're just going to be a lot more expensive <laughs> uh, bad habits as that comes along. And, and I see that uh, a ton from clients that are like, hey, yep, went from making 30000 now I'm making 100000 And they're in greater debt than they were before because, yeah, they just, uh, they thought 100000 was a magical number and it meant that they could never overspend that. Turns out you can. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can spend money on and, and kind of hit the buy now and, and have those things. So, uh having good habits, being disciplined is always going to be the core of being financially successful, just like it is with anything else in, in your life. If uh, you want to be healthy, well, you have to have good habits uh, for that as well. Uh, if there's any other things that you've wanted to accomplish, like this career change, well, it wasn't just getting lucky, right? Uh, you can get lucky, but if you don't actually do the work, you'll get found out and you will get weeded out. 
Um, even though it might feel like that for most of you with that imposter syndrome that will probably pop up from time to time, if you're putting in the work, those are good habits. You're, you're putting in the work, you're being disciplined, you're showing up every day, you're doing your work and success will come to you in your career. And so at the end of the day, financial stuff isn't that much different than career stuff, family stuff, health stuff. It, it's all kind of the same. Um, obviously it's different, different tools, different mechanics, maybe different mindset that you have to get into. But uh, at the end of the day, it's Hey, what's, what's the game plan? How are we going to build in this direction and start making things happen for yourself? And yeah, having a game plan is, is super important. And why, what, in your opinion, uh, would you say that you need a, a, a plan? Uh, you guys can use the chat for that uh, if you want. Give you guys a couple seconds. I'll let Shelly chime in too if Shelly wants to. Oh man, to beat me to it. Good. Yeah. Uh, to make a budget so you don't spend more than you should. Yep. <laughs> that helps, right? If you don't know how much money you have that you can be throwing at something, um, yeah, it's very easy to either overspend. And and sometimes I've ran into people where um, they they underspend because they don't know what the plan is. They don't know if they could spend more. Um, I, I think it's more typical where people overspend because they don't have a plan, but uh, there are like super savers out there who are just like freaked out that like, oh no, if I do this, something bad's gonna happen. And then I look at their stuff, I was like, oh no, you guys can retire way earlier than you thought. You can uh, travel a lot more, spend a lot more money. And so I have to uh, remind people that sometimes are getting in the way by saving too much. Uh, hey, there's there's definitely room for you guys to spend more if that's what you want to do. Uh, Tina said to have savings for job layoffs, unexpected expenses, for sure. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, you, we're going to create a plan, you'll have your plan and nothing ever goes according to plan. It's not in your plan for the layoffs, right? But if you've already started building progress, you're starting to build resources and assets and build an emergency savings, and then an emergency actually comes up, it's way better than not having that uh, there because it, it allows you to have a lot more flexibility and possibilities, uh, wait for the right job, not just taking the first job because you have savings to kind of lean on, um, and so, yeah, both, both of those are good answers there. And let me see if I can pronounce this guy's name right. So a goal without a plan is just a wish. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I, I, I forget how to do it. I, I practiced it before the thing. Um, but uh, that guy <laughs> said a goal without a plan is just a wish. And it's true. How many of you? know people that said, hey, I wish I could do this. Or they hear about you making a, a career change. They're like, oh, I wish I could do that. Well, what's what's stopping you? Like you can choose to do what you want to do. You just kind of have to put it, put it down and, and actually make an outline of how to get there. Uh, Collab Lab it, for a lot of you is part of this plan, right? To transition into tech. So um, at, at the end of the day, it's so much more helpful just to have that clear path as far as, hey, if I start moving along these directions, and it's not going to be perfect, uh, but at least you know kind of what those mile markers look like, what to expect, and and how each each step you take is actually going to help with that desired outcome. That's going to be crucial. So, um, a plan is also going to help you know, well, where the heck are you today? So a lot of people don't know that, especially if you've already been working for a while and you got stuff here, there, I'll have clients that occasionally they, they're like, oh yeah, like I still have a child savings account somewhere at an old credit union. And, and all of a sudden we find out there's a decent chunk there. Uh, we'll randomly find life insurance, old 401k accounts and, and all kinds of things. So like what, what's all the stuff you have now? You might do be doing better than you think. Um, there might be, if you have a partner, sometimes there might be things that you're not aware of, like, oh, there's extra credit cards or extra things out there that maybe uh, you didn't know were out there too. So let's get clarity, at, um, building that plan. You're going to figure out, well, where's your stuff now? Where are you? Uh, where are you going? So those are those goals that you're aiming for. 
And then, and then we start to draw that line between them and those mile markers. And hey, are you on track to meet those? And, and if not, what are those actions that you can take? So if we were to actually put this into like a quick, quick scratch out, quick plan here, um, step one, super important. I'm, I'm raising little kids right now and I want them to believe that they're able to do whatever they want to, because I think that's like the most powerful thing of, of any like human can believe or, or like think is, hey, you're capable of doing what you want to do. And once you have that in place, then you can start moving towards, well, what is it that you actually want to do? Because again, you probably know a lot of people, or maybe you've been like this with certain things at some points in your life where it's like, no, I, I can't do that, or I don't deserve this, or whatever kind of gunk is in your head about kind of negative thinking. But it, if, if that's really your thinking, even if you do start move, moving and working towards something, that's if that thought's in there, it's going to sabotage you. And, and that's what I've seen happen a lot of times. So I always had to remind my clients when I'm speaking with them, like if they start getting too negative, like, oh yeah, like I'm stupid with money, bad with money or whatever. Like, no, like we just made some accidents. Um, we got a lot of opportunity here now with what's ahead of us. So now it's like, let's just fix what we can fix now and and move forward. And and obviously I'm here to, to help or whatever. And, and for you guys, whatever your situation is, like there's a lot of game left to be played. And so you you have a ton of time to uh, get back on track if you're not there already. So uh, believe in yourself is definitely going to be a huge one. Identify goals that are meaningful to you. So not goals that your parents say should be important, not goals that your coworkers say should be important to you. Um, you see a lot of that um, <laughs> on social media and just uh, at like family events, right? Um, where it's like, oh, like when when is a baby coming or when are you getting married or when are you getting that job and, and all these different things that go. Um, so sometimes it's very easy to be like, oh, well, yeah, let's just do what everyone thinks I'm supposed to do. And if you're going to try doing those things, it's not going to be fun for one, but also you probably are less likely to achieve it because you don't really want to. So find out what those important things are for you. Do you want to travel the world? Uh, if that's fun and meaningful for you, well, let's let's put that down and then let's see how we can make those things happen. So uh, identify those goals that will actually get you to take action. Um, assess your resources. So again, this is for ground. Well, where are you today? Let's hunt down all of your stuff that's out there. Uh, do you need to rely on any of these to kind of builds you some runway to search for jobs and, and things like that. Um, and also you're your biggest resource right now. So don't, don't forget that. So invest in yourself, kind of like what you're doing with collab lab with any other things that you kind of take on to kind of just grow your uh, career. Um, you're your biggest resource by far all the way up until probably uh, you're in your like mid fifties. And it maybe at that point um, less, less value as far as you yourself kind of generating income and resources for yourself. And, and hopefully you'll have a big chunk of assets already there that will be predominantly your resources moving forward. But um, until then, many, many years where you're going to be your biggest kind of resource. And so definitely take care of yourself and, and uh, be mindful of that. And then when, once you kind of do this, you start to lay out the path. Are you on track? If not, don't get discouraged. If you're ahead of the game, we'll ask yourself questions like, hey, is, does that mean that maybe you're going to change things up um, and, and find out what those actions would be on, on both ends. So if you need to make changes because, hey, it's not looking pretty, well, what are those? Should we start uh, with one month of savings first because maybe you don't have any, or if you have one month of savings, maybe we want to aim for three months. Uh, maybe there's retirement that you want to track. Maybe you uh, want to make sure that you go on vacation. Uh, I have a lot of clients sometimes that are like, hey, we've never been able to go on vacation. They get all this income and like, can we go on vacation now? Like, well, let's, let's take a look. Yes. You, you have X amount where you could easily spend on vacation. And so uh, start to build out these different things that are important to you and, and start to make progress towards those. And even if you're way behind, you might see that like, Hey, there, there's a big gap. Um, don't feel overwhelmed by that at all. Just, well, what's, what's a meaningful step that you can do? So if it looks like you need to save a thousand dollars a month, what well, can you find $200 a month to start saving? Uh, that will start kind of building some momentum. And one thing I've seen is as you build momentum and start to make financial progress, you start to feel really good and, and you'll start to be like, well, that actually wasn't so hard. That wasn't so bad. And it feels really good. Let me see if I can find more ways to, to get that good feeling and start to build this momentum. And 
yeah, just by having this stuff start to work out for you, you start to see your assets accumulate, your savings grow, your investments grow. It, it just kind of uh, gives you that positive reinforcement to kind of keep keep finding those ways that, to make that happen even faster. And over time, these things will snowball in a good way for you. Um, and it's called compound uh, interest is basically what happens is where uh, not only you earn an interest on what you have, but then that interest that you had that, that was given to you actually earns interest itself. And so these things start to, to snowball and get really big uh, between now and in the future when you'll need those funds. Any questions up to this point? I'll give you guys a second. I'll... Nope, nope, perfect. So in this one, I want you to see if you can spot the difference between the, the left side and the right side. So the difference between struggling and someone that's financially successful, and it it's, seems like pretty small, <laughs> the differences, uh, but it actually tends to be a pretty big thing when I end up diving into the weeds with people. So what do you think the, the biggest difference are between the, the left and right side of those green dots? I'll jump in. Savings is only on the left side. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Savings is only on the left. So we got Aubrey. Let's just say. There's room to do other things. Yep. Let's see. Amanda needs and wants have the same priority instead of needs coming before wants. Yep. Yep, no, no worries, Aubrey. This is a, a little funky looking with the, the dots here. So yeah, I think those are the main things, right? So savings, uh, not accounted for. And so here, I'll kind of circle the guys. So savings wasn't showing up out at all, right? So this person over here totally forgets to put savings on the radar. They're like, hey, I'm making so much money. I don't need to save. Uh, that's probably not a good plan because yeah, it doesn't take um, too much uh, where something negative could happen. And, and it actually puts people that make a ton of money in a worse position if they're not saving and they're like, oh, I'm just making so much money. I don't need to save. Well, what happens when a layoff comes? They're not, they don't have any savings and they're used to spending $10,000 a month. <laughs> like they're going to start going to credit card debt very quickly. And credit cards right now, I think the highest <laughs> rates on credit cards is like 32%. Um, probably like an average one is like 22, 24% that's a ton of free money you're giving to credit card companies because you forgot to save. Um, so yeah, savings is a big one that can definitely shoot yourself in the foot. The more money you make, the more you should be saving because otherwise you will find yourself in a nastier spot than someone that's making less money and saving just a small amount. Uh, then the needs and wants definitely should not go on the same line. You, should, you need to figure out really quickly as far as, hey, what's actually needed and what's a want. And, and always just have that understanding. I was like, oh, I want this and you can definitely do a lot of your wants. The problem is you probably can't do all of them uh, if if they're not accounted for, right? So that's where the budgeting comes into is like, can you afford the wants in addition to the needs? And once you guys are making a certain amount of income in tech, most likely you'll be able to afford a lot of wants. Um, it just depends on kind of how many you're trying to squeeze in and in and, and what time span. So I always like to remind people like, yeah, you can probably do all the things you want to do. You just can't do them all this year. You're not going to want to buy a new boat, a new car, new everything the first year that you you earned <laughs> your income. Uh, that's not going to line up right and, and things are going to feel very crazy financially. So one of my favorite things about working with a lot of uh, people that transition in from boot camps or however it is, um, and just starting new careers, there's a ton of new possibilities that come up when the income jumps. And so, well, do you need to catch up? Were you behind? Awesome. You can do that now. Um, there's going to be things that come up that you may have never thought was possible and hey, you can probably do those things too. So uh, once you kind of build out your plan, if you're going to be way ahead of the uh, way ahead of where you're expecting now that you have this nice new income going, well, what does that mean? Is there things that maybe 
you've written off in the past because you're like, oh, no, I'll never be able to do that. Well, let's revisit some of those because some of them might be possible again. Um, finally have peace of mind. Uh, that's <laughs> that's an amazing thing to get to uh, if you haven't been there in the past or if you've uh, been there fleetingly in the past. Um, having financial peace of mind definitely just helps with health. It helps with, with everything. Uh, it helps with relationships. Um, and another cool thing that I've seen is you can take more risks. Um, so you can go independent, you can start playing around and creating your own projects and launching your own business, your own startup. Um, and so once, once you have kind of that income rolling in, if you start to build up assets and wealth, well, they'll just be more there for you to do other things with in the future. And who, who here thought they could retire early? Not, not too many people do think they could retire early. That's, uh, I think a lot of people uh, have the mindset of I'll work till I'm dead or, or I'll, I'll work until like I'm not allowed to work anymore. Well, now with, with a potentially huge change in income, there's a good chance that if you wanted to, if you kind of structure things right, uh, you probably could retire early. And again, that's just probably something that you never really dreamt of and, and didn't really give it too much time. Um, and very, very possible for sure with the career change. So now we'll just kind of go over a couple examples. So this first one is someone that received a pay raise. So their new salary is 75,000 and, and after taxes, it's about $15,000 a year after tax. Uh, so 1,250 like real dollars after tax a month that they're getting, which is, is pretty life-changing for them. They're like, holy smokes, this is crazy. Uh, but they also have some stuff going on, right? So the before their career change, they accumulated some debt. So they had $10,000 credit card debt. It has a $100 minimum payment and 22% interest. So that's that's not fun. That's pretty costly. If they just carry that same balance consistently, they pay $2,200 a year um, just in the interest without even paying down the credit card. So that's why credit cards get to be such a pain in the butt. Uh, auto loan, they have $25,000 auto loan with a $350 payment. That interest rate is only 4%. And I don't mind that. Uh, a small, a low interest rate is not too bad. I think right now there's not too many auto loans that are actually that low anymore. Uh, a year or two ago when I first started doing this presentation, very common. Uh, but now I'm starting to see like 6 and 7%. So now, now interest rates are a little bit more scary uh, just for kind of a reference point. Uh, but with their new job, they'll have a 401k with a 3% match. I'm happy to answer questions on 401k if you guys haven't had those in the past. Um, but the 3% match basically says the employer is going to give them free money if they put money in. Um, and right now they don't have an emergency fund. So this is, that's kind of their base scenario here. So with that extra amount that they have, what I would say is, hey, definitely do enough to get that employer match. So put in 3% so the employer gives you 3%. So basically it's $188 a month that they're taking out of their paycheck, going towards that. Their employer is also going to put $188 a month uh, for free for them. Um, the additional amount, I'd say make your normal payments with the other stuff, but let's focus on paying off that high interest credit card. So the rest the rest of that pay increase is going to go towards a credit card. Um, I'd stop using the card. A lot of times it's tricky to pay it off if you're using it and, and trying to pay it off faster. Um, because you tend to maybe use it more when you see the balance coming down. Like, oh yeah, I, I can put a little bit more on the credit card. And so you're not making as much progress as you think. You pay uh, an extra 1,062 towards it, but then if you spend an extra $500 more uh, than you normally would, well, you're not really making that $1,062 payment anymore. Um, so that's why I like to tell uh, my clients that have some credit card stuff that we're trying to knock out, like, hey, let's not use that. And, and make sure that this is truly going to paint it down faster. And if they do that, it's going to be paid off in nine and a half months. So uh, within a year, that monkey on their back is no longer going to be there. And uh, in the meantime, just maintain the current auto loan uh, payment. I'm not too worried about that. After the credit card is paid off, that additional amount that's going to be saved. So it's not just 1062 but the additional hundred dollars they had to pay every month anyways. So 1,162, start chucking it into emergency savings. Uh, now they got really great interest rates. Um, uh, Ally Bank, Capital One, they're about like 3.4%. There's another one too. Marcus by Goldman Sachs is 3.75% interest rate on a savings account. Um, 
it's really incredible <laughs> now when about this time last year it was 0.05 percent most places and so uh, what that means is you for for that uh, auto loan you're almost getting the same amount that you're paying in interest on that um but yeah if you're able to start building that emergency savings and then also get in a return from the interest there um that's gonna be a good thing to go and uh, another kind of advanced way to do this if we want to make it a little bit more complicated is uh, you can also start to split stuff off a little bit too. So if you, maybe maybe the emergency savings gets to 5,000, you're like, that's a good place uh, to start pulling back on that contribution to the savings. Well, you could still put some into there, but then the other portion, you can start moving off towards other goals like travel, like increasing your retirement uh, savings and things like that. The key is, well, as long as you're not spending it and it's going towards things that are going to be valuable to you, um, it's definitely going to help there. So this is a different example, um, same same person, kind of same situation, um, but just kind of changing up a little bit. So same, same $75,000 salary, same $1,250 a month increase after tax, same 401k uh, with a 3% match. They're going to retire at their normal retirement age, basically. Um, so that if they, and that's just doing the 3% only. So um, they're all they have to do is save that three percent, get the employer match, and and they'll retire at normal retirement age, age sixty five. So I don't know if that sounds exciting for anyone, normal retirement age, uh, but that's typically what normal retirement age is sixty five is. So just and, and then they're spending the rest, right? So they're they're able to do that. And then if they wanted to retire early, though, this would actually cut off a lot of time for them. So instead of spending it all, just throwing it all into the retirement. Um, they'd be able to retire seven and a half years sooner. So that's really the the trade-off between, eh, do they want to spend it just kind of all throughout now, all the way through age 65 and just retire at age 65, or um, don't really change the lifestyle from before that career change and just pour it all into the, the 401k and start investing that pretty heavily. Well, they'll be able to retire seven and a half years sooner. And then there's different things in between. So give or take, save about half of that, probably retire about three years earlier. Um, so um, that's one of the benefits of when you do have that plan, you can kind of run side by side analysis like, hey, this is great. Well, what if I want to do this? Well, you have the plan already, make the tweak, find out what the difference is. And that can kind of help you figure out those different decisions that you want to make. So a lot of times that's helpful for my clients is like, hey, if you save an extra $500, it means you can save two, it means you can retire two years earlier. And some of my clients that are really driven by that are like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that right now. I'll stop spending and, and I'll be more than happy to retire two years sooner. So uh, with that information, it kind of gives you, it empowers you to be able to make those decisions once you have that uh, goal post set up with your plan. Any questions to this point before I kind of dive into the frequently asked questions? Nope. Perfect. So this one is pretty quick. I, I like it because, yeah, again, these things just come up all the time. Um, so term life insurance versus whole life insurance. I'm a big fan of term life insurance because it's really cheap to get you a huge amount of benefit for your family, for your loved ones, the people that uh, probably rely on your income or will be relying on your income when you receive a big kind of pay increase. Um, so the biggest knock on whole life insurance is it costs a ton. The insurance agents that sell it to you make a ton <laughs> for selling it to you. And that's often why they don't even mention term life. They're like, oh no, this is what you need right here. Don't even look, don't even look at what's under that hat. Um, I got the right one right here. This is the best thing for you. And what happens is a lot of times they'll do that and you'll be underinsured. So you'll be paying a ton and not have the proper coverage to protect your loved ones. And, and that's a huge disservice to, to you and whoever they're doing that to. Um, so whole life insurance, the one of the reasons why it's, it's so costly is you're going to have that for your whole life, basically. So if you buy it when you're 20, well, you're probably going to pay for it for a very long time through 60, 70, 80. And at some point you are going to die, right? So the insurance company knows that eventually they're going to have to pay it out. With term life insurance, you say, hey, I want to buy a 15-year term. Basically, it means that you're going to pay a, a very small amount for that 15 years, 
And once that 15 years expires, uh, basically you don't have to make that payment anymore, but you're not going to be covered anymore. So you want to find out what that right size is for the term. Maybe it's 20 years, maybe it's 25, maybe it's 15. Um, and for an example, why I like term instead of whole life is I don't think if you're in tech that you need whole life insurance forever because you're going to be building up your assets and resources. So your 401k is going to be going up, your investments are going to be going up, your savings are going to be going up. Uh, if you have debt, like a home mortgage, that's going to be going down, going down. And so you actually are going to have a whole bunch of wealth built up over the next 15 years. And eventually, if something were to happen to you, well, there's a whole bunch of resources that you've already accumulated where you no longer need life insurance there. And so that's why, uh, especially for people in tech, I don't think that there's a, a important to have whole life insurance for the rest of your life. And uh, and have that because again, the, the cost is way more than it needs to be. Um, and the insurance is probably way longer than what you'll need to be because you're going to be building up resources and assets over the next 10 to 15 years pretty easily. Any questions on, on life insurance? I know there, there's some exotic things that sometimes people uh, will throw out there for whole life insurance as far as like using whole life insurance for retirement and stuff like that. Anyone run into that? Doesn't look like it. Perfect. So this next one is, hey, with this extra money, should I make extra debt repayment or should I do a 401k contribution? And so I actually tackled this in the example um, where we want to do the match for sure. So if you're getting a match, definitely do up until that point first. And then if you have high interest debt, so like that credit card, it was like 22%. The rest should be going towards that. Um, and so that's really pretty easy and, and straightforward. If the interest rates are a lot smaller, so like in that auto loan of four percent, um at that one, I'm not too worried about it. So so you could probably still uh be more aggressive with the 401k contribution after the match if you want. It'll come down to more of um kind of personal preference, what your goals and objectives are. And heck, maybe, maybe there's other stuff. If you only have low interest debt and and a chunk of extra money, well, maybe there's just like things like travel that we want to make sure that we plan for. Uh, then the extra amount can either go towards the 401k or go towards paying down the auto loan. But anything with super high interest rate, we definitely want to tackle that guy. Oh, Aubrey asked about a LERP. Yep. So that's that's exactly what I was talking about. So there's this is going back to the whole life insurance is there they kind of tack these things onto whole life insurance specifically um, where they make them a little bit more complicated than they need to be. And then they also do these projections and say that you can do a lot of things, which you can, but a lot of times the projections aren't necessarily always going to buy out how they kind of present them. Um, and again, they're not, not typically in the best interest for most people uh, depending on kind of what your goals and objectives are. So yeah, there's there's some sales tactics that they'll use. And at the end of the day, the agents don't um, know what, what's going on with them. They're taught by their employer, basically. Like, hey, this is what you say. Again, it's the best thing since sliced bread. And that's how they present it. They think it's the best thing for you, uh, even though a, a lot of times it's not. So they're, they're just reading what they were taught in their sales class, basically, of of how to sell those things. And um, it sounds like Aubrey's a little bit familiar with, her, uh, with them, and I agree with her completely. Just be careful with them. Um, some people could find value in them, but they, usually they're not as great as they're being pitched out to be. So um, definitely, if, if you run into anyone and they're trying to sell you something like that, feel free to, to ping me a message, and I'll send you some resources to, to just make sure that you're aware of um, the downsides, right? Because I don't think they ever say, hey, here's the cons of this. They're like, nope, here's the best situation that could ever apply. And the, the likelihood that bears out for you is not going to be as high. Any questions on the 401k versus debt repayment question? We can get it there. So the next one is rent versus buy. 
So this one is tricky because all the way up until last year before interest rates started going up, there was a lot of benefits to buying over renting, uh, primarily because a lot of times and for a lot of places throughout the United States, at least, you could buy and the monthly payment sometimes would be the same or less than renting. Now interest rates have skyrocketed, home prices have not dropped. <laughs> and so the monthly payment on kind of like an equivalent property to renting is tends to be a lot higher, it looks like now than if you were renting. Um, so not as straightforward as it always used to be. If it's important for you to kind of lock in where you're going to be able to live and you love the place where you're going to be, buying still might be on the table for you. Um, and, and it's really going to come down to, hey, make sure that you do your due diligence, make sure uh, you're pretty confident that you're not going to have to relocate in the next year or two. Uh, because buying a house and selling a house, it's costly on both ends. So it costs money to buy a house with closing costs, uh, as well as selling with closing costs. And so uh, that would be a lot of costs to accumulate in a, a short time span. And you may not have received home appreciation in such a time, time, uh, such a tight window of time. So uh, I'd say definitely just be more cautious. But if you are confident, like, hey, this is where I want to be anyways, I know uh, there's a chance of me relocating super low, um, then it, it may make sense for you to still buy, even though technically on a monthly basis, you might be paying a little bit more. Uh, the benefits of buying are you do start to get home appreciation if the value goes up uh, with the property. As you make your mortgage payments, you're also paying down the principal, which is building up your home equity, which doesn't happen when you rent. So those are really going to be the, the biggest benefits. Um, uh, there's a lot of other things too, right? Like you can do whatever you want to your walls. You can do whatever you want inside without having to get that approved by anyone. Uh, the benefits of renting is flexibility. You don't like what's going on. Well, you can go find another place to rent uh, pretty easily and you can bounce around until you do find somewhere that's a good fit for you. If your location is not always known as far as where you want to be, well, yeah, you probably don't want to lock in by buying. And again, flexibility is really the biggest benefits of renting, uh, as well as right now for the uh, the current economic situation, there is probably a slight savings that you'll see uh, a month um, by renting versus buying right now. Anyone kind of going through this, uh, weighing these options right now and have any questions on that? No, perfect. So this one becomes more important and more timely uh, once you are kind of making uh, more income than you're used to have uh, kind of like a surplus of income. You've got all your needs covered. And then it comes down to well, what's actually going to improve that happiness a little bit more. Uh, for a lot of people where you see that bump in happiness, even once you're making more money is saving time. <laughs> and so um you, you want to make sure that it's going to make sense for you, but and it is going to come down to what you value most here. So there's no right or wrong necessarily. And you can't just throw an unlimited amount of money at things to save you time because you got to still be able to afford it. But things like, hey, when we get a bad snowstorm here and if my kids were up sick or something and I'm, I'm not about to go out and shovel, I will pay someone to go and do that for me. It's going to save me a ton of time and I'm more than happy to spend the money I have someone pick up after my dog weekly and that's money well spent as well. And otherwise it would take me a lot of time. And so there's a whole bunch of ways that you're probably already saving time. If you go to, to Starbucks and a barista makes something for you, if you go out to eat and someone's cooking for you, your dishwasher. Um, I know you probably don't think about it this way, but uh, not everyone had dishwashers like 50 years ago, or probably no one had them at a hundred years ago. And so what happened is it takes a ton of time to, to do the dishes. Our dishwasher broke a few months ago and I figured that out the hard way. I had to hand wash everything and with as many kids as we have. Um, it, my hands were super dried out and I spent probably like two hours a day, like just doing the dishes and I could not wait for my dish new dishwasher to get here. So, um, spending money to save time and allow you to have more time for the things that you enjoy, uh, have more time to make more money for yourself. So uh, that's another thing that you will have unique skill sets where you can actually make money outside of your work by doing 
um, uh, freelance stuff. And so, yeah, you could make dinner every night, but if you don't necessarily enjoy it, and if there's someone that's willing to give you a project and for that hour each night, you can actually do something else and have uh, DoorDash deliver it to you. Well, you'll probably make more money in that hour than you would have spent cooking and cleaning. And, and you get your food delivered for way less than what you're getting paid for those things. So um, the time versus money aspect is going to start becoming more and more uh, critical for you to kind of weigh with different uh, things that come up. And obviously what's important to you is going to be different from uh, everyone else. I actually now enjoy cooking when that wasn't necessarily my thing before. And so now, yep, I could save time, but I actually enjoy cooking. So um, it's, it's not actually adding that much value as it would as if I hated cooking and I had to take the time to, to spend uh, making food and things like that. So the kind of stinky part of tech is that the lifestyle creep is really the, the thing that I've seen happen a lot. And I, I mentioned it earlier is, well, if your income jumps up, it's really easy to spend all that and sometimes even more. And if you're spending way more than you're saving, it really puts yourself in a worse position than before you even got these raises, before you got these huge pay jumps, uh, because it does not take too much to, to really snowball you uh, into debt and start to accumulate a lot of credit cards and things like that. Um, so lifestyle creep is something that you want to be aware of. Definitely reward yourself for all the hard work. Definitely enjoy the promotions and bonuses and things like that. Uh, but just make sure that you're doing it in moderation and, and making sure that you're saving for that future self um, to, to make sure that if something weird were to happen, like layoffs, um, layoffs have been in the news pretty predominantly. I expect to hear them uh, probably through at least the rest of this year. So I don't see those going away as far as being news topics anytime soon. Um, so that that's why it's important to yeah, start building those emergency savings, start paying off that credit card debt and if you avoid a layoff, well, you're just that much better off for kind of being prepared for that. Uh, and if they do occur, well, you bought yourself a lot more uh, peace of mind and stability than if you didn't take those steps originally. Sometimes if you go to a tech startup, uh, they might not have the benefits that uh, a more established company would have. And so that's something to be aware of too. Uh, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take these opportunities. You want to kind of line up everything that's important to you, what's what's going on, if, if you think it'll be good for your career trajectory and things like that. Um, but it is important if, if you're not going to get health insurance there, um, make sure that you're aware of how you can get life insurance and what that cost will be and make sure you kind of weigh all those things together. Um, and, and, and there's other things too. A lot of startup companies will be like, hey, we got a 401k, but we don't do a match. Well, that's different than a, a company that does offer a 401k and offers a match. Um, especially if it's a large match. I've seen some that are very high, like 10, 12% matches. Uh, then I've seen some, again, with 0%. And so just because they offer a 401k, they'll market it like, hey, we got a 401k. Like if they're not giving you a match, it's not really that great actually. So, so you can discount that. And don't want to leave it on the negative side because there's amazing things that come with it, right? So the, the high income, Lots of new possibilities, opportunities that we talked about. Uh, employer stock it could be a game changer. Sometimes it's a small game changer. Sometimes it's a gigantic one. So um, definitely uh, weigh uh, the pros and cons of that. And I think the biggest thing it does is it gives you a lot more control over your future, uh, about the life you want to live and how you want to live it, uh, I think is really all most people can ever ask for. Um, hopefully you enjoy what you're doing too. Um, but uh, besides that, there's these benefits to look forward to. So that's all the stuff we covered today, that the how to be financially successful. I uh, gave you a couple example scenarios to kind of uh, at least kind of mentally gauge as far as the trade-offs of doing different things, depending on uh, whether you have debt, whether you don't, um, the this or that with the frequently asked questions and what to be aware of in tech. And then again, uh, the positive side of tech too. And with that, I'll kind of open up for uh, Q&A and yeah, uh, you can definitely ask any questions you, you guys want and, and I can get into the weeds if you like. And it's tax season right now too. So feel free to ask any tax questions. I, I've been <laughs> well, well versed in taxes this year.
I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but I just wanted to say again that so I went through this session, as you all know, a year ago and took all of the advice to heart. Um, definitely got my employer match on the 401k. Um, so I'm thrilled that I got a big fat chunk of change before I got laid off is in there. Um, but also building up the savings again, because at first I was like, you know what? Got big fat paychecks. What? I mean, they weren't that big, but they were bigger than. So yeah, yeah. why worry about it? Um, and now I'm really glad that I did, right? Because I got laid off and I have six months savings. So I don't have to stress and I can be picky about my job again. So um, that was invaluable advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's amazing, right? Because, yeah, it's very easy to come to something and then not not do a single thing and not not take anything to heart. And, and you definitely... We're like, oh yeah, let's let's do that, and then, and then that little uh, devil Shelly showed up on your shoulder, like maybe we don't need to save as much, and you're like, no, let's let's do it just in case, and then you could always spend the money in the future after you got the six months going. Um, how how did it feel while you were building up the savings? Like, did you feel kind of like that momentum growing? Like, man, this is like oh fun. yeah, it it felt great because I mean, it's it's exactly the way you put that is. I was living on this much. So I just kept doing it. You know, I, I think we took a slightly more expensive vacation. Um, I'm, I, you know, splurged on little things, but mm -hmm. didn't, didn't buy the sailboat, didn't, didn't <laughs> buy a new car, kept everything else just the way it was. Um, and so it didn't hurt. It felt great actually. And, you know, just seeing my savings grow because I had, between boot camp and then the seven months it took me to find a job, you know, I really didn't have any income for about a year. So I was, I was moving on fumes at that point. So um, it was nice that it, that it pretty much got all the way built back up again in the nick of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And again, congrats to you to, to do that and then put yourself in this position. Cause yeah, I, I imagine <laughs> if, if you hadn't done that, you would have been a little bit more stressed out at this point um, having to navigate this. And again, like, it's very easy when you're in that kind of frantic state of mind to be like, oh yeah, I'll take anything. And then all of a sudden it's not a good fit. And then you're, you're back, back to square one again, a few months on the road. Perfect. If there's no questions and answers. And if there's anything that you want to ask me privately, again, Slack, I'll go ahead and shoot me any questions over there. Um, pretty active on Twitter, pretty active on LinkedIn, on YouTube. If you just kind of want to check out what's there, you can definitely do that. Um, and <laughs> I put your network as your net worth, which is a, a popular saying. And I think it's important like in tech, in career building and relationships and just having cool people to, to be able to, to chat with. Um, don't just do it when you need work, um, do it preemptively so that you're not scrambling. Uh, you'll get multiple months ahead of the, <laughs> the game uh, versus if you're just cold, cold going in, into networking. It's like, all right, well, you're starting from square one. Uh, and so it's going to take a little bit longer for your network to know who you are, what you are, and, and where they can kind of get you connected in the right spot. So, yeah, I think it's uh, cool. Ab Labs, amazing. As you all know, you just went through it and um, yeah, best, best of luck. Uh, hopefully you land something that you guys are excited about. That's a good fit. That's going to help you uh, grow in your career. And I, I know imposter syndrome is a huge thing. So reach out to people, uh, so that you can get talked out of the, the mind gunk that is getting in your ways of, of making progress because yeah, at, <laughs> you're going to do a lot of cool things along the way to you. Uh, not just the, the small things, the small little mistakes that everyone makes. And so, uh, I'm excited to see where y'all go. Thank you so much. This was awesome. And yep. everyone, congratulations on just a few more days, getting <laughs> yep. all your stuff done. And I hope to see you all on Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.